Good morning, everyone. I'm Kevin Merritt. I'm the founder and CEO of Socrata. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedules to join me. I, I, I caught a little bit of Beth and Cam's intro. I know you all have come from far places around the globe, from the UK, from Canada, from Mexico, from all sorts of parts of the country, uh, even from Chamonix, France, I see here in, in the uh, crowd. Thank you so much. Uh, I know it's not only a commitment of, of journey, of distance for you all, but it's a commitment of time. And I really appreciate you being here. I'm super excited. This is a historic moment uh, for Socrata. This is our first ever so, uh, customer summit. It's just uh, really exciting for us as a company to mature and start thinking about the, the opportunity uh, to meet with you all, to talk about open data, to talk about where this vision for open data is going. So, so thank you so much for, uh, for taking time out of your schedule uh, to join us here. Um, so th this, this summit is all about connections. It's all about the conversations that we're all going to have with each other over today and, to, and tomorrow. So I'm super excited to, to be a participant in these conversations. Uh, I'm super excited to share some of the thoughts and ideas that, that I have, but more importantly, I'm excited to hear about the thoughts and the ideas and the vision and the experiences that you all have had as you've started to kind of pioneer down this path of open data. So before I get started and, and share with you some of my own thoughts, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge uh, some of the people who have joined us, some of the organizations that have joined us, uh, some of the individuals and associations that are here with us today. So, so first of all, I'm delighted that some of our best customers are with us. Uh, those include the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, um, NOAA, NASA, EPA, the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. If you can turn the volume down on that a little bit, it'd be great. Uh, Department of Commerce, uh, Transportation, uh, the Department of Justice, U.S. Treasury is here, uh, the Export-Import Bank. Uh, the Internal Revenue Service is here. Both, both sides of, uh, of Congress are here, so we've got the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate joining us. Uh, we're, we're fortunate to have some of the strongest counties in the United States here with us. Uh, Montgomery County, Prince George's County, um, Miami-Dade County is here, Howard County, Strathcona County from, from Canada is here, even West Sussex County from the U.K. is here with us as well. So welcome. Uh, you all. We're, we're fortunate to have some really fantastic cities here as well. So government employees from a number of cities are, are joining us, including Boston in Cambridge, uh, Edmonton up in Canada, uh, Providence, Hartford, uh, the city of Chicago, you know, really one of the pioneers of this whole open data movement. Uh, Gainesville, Florida is in the house, Durham in North Carolina, Las Vegas, uh, the team from Kansas City. So hopefully the next game of the World Series will have a little bit of a different outcome for you folks, but uh, we're delighted to have you here with us as well. Uh, the great city of Baltimore, uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee is here as well. So some really strong cities uh, that are just doing some great things in the open data movement are here with us. Um, I'm pleased that a number of government employees from some great states around the country are here with us as well. Uh, Maryland, Montana, Kentucky, Iowa, Oklahoma, Michigan, New York, New Jersey, Washington, Hawaii, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and California are all here. The great state of Texas is here represented not only by employees of the state, but also some of the most innovative cities within the state of Texas. Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, and Murphy, Texas are here. Uh, recently, we launched an initiative called the Open Data Network, and some of our partners in the Open Data Network are here. So we're delighted to have representation from Google and SiteComply and Zillow, and you'll hear from them uh, later today and tomorrow as well. The most forward-thinking academic institutions are now just beginning to adopt open data, and we're, we're blessed to have some of the most innovating academic institutions with us here in this two-day event as well. So the D.C. Public Charter School Board is here. The American University and the City University of New York is here as well. While all of these governments are doing great work and these great uh, academic institution, institutions are doing great work on open data, it's not just the domain of governments and higher learning. There are some really strong associations and nonprofits and multilateral organizations and non-governmental organizations that are pioneering work in this open data space as well. And so we're delighted to have amongst 
the audience and participants today, the National League of Cities, the World Bank, representatives from the United Nations, the Inter-American Development Bank, the Carbon Disclosure Project from the UK, Bloomberg Philanthropies, the Star Communities, the Urban Institute, Bennett Midland, the U.S. Agency for, for International Development, and the Smart Chicago Collaborative. And last but not least, uh, I'd like to say that the only jurisdiction with taxation but without representation is here, the District of Columbia as well. So there are a number of individuals who I'd like to call out that are here, and I would encourage you to seek these folks out uh, over the rest of today and tomorrow. These are some of the really most pioneering individuals in the open data landscape. Uh, these are folks that I've had the opportunity to spend some time with over the, the last couple of years, as well as uh, new acquaintances and new friends that I'm getting to know just now. So Mayor Andy Burke of the city of Chattanooga, Tennessee is here. Uh, Stephen Goldsmith, who's with the Harvard Kennedy School for Government and was formerly the mayor of the city of Indianapolis and the deputy mayor of New York City, is here with us. Don Kettle, who's the outgoing dean of the University of Maryland's School of Public Policy. David Eaves, one of the most innovative and thoughtful and well-respected open data pioneers from Vancouver, Canada, is here with us as well. Hudson Hollister, you know, one of the most hardworking uh, and most ambitious individuals I've met. Uh, he's the executive director of the Data Transparency Coalition. He's here with us today, and I would encourage you to find some time and chat with Hudson about financial transparency. Waldo Jaquith and Jason Hare are both here representing the U.S. nodes of the Open Data Institute. Abi Namani, who was previously the, the co-executive director of Code for America and who's now the first chief data officer in the city of Los Angeles, is here with us. Uh, I'm delighted to have Samantha Mowbray here from West Sussex County in the UK, you know, really one of the most pioneering leaders when it comes to performance management uh, in the UK. Connor Riffle, the Director of Cities and Data Product Innovation for the Carbon Disclosure Project, is joining us from London today. Andrew Nicklin, who uh, I know Cam and, and Beth mentioned Andrew already, but it's worth repeating again, did phenomenal work pioneering the work in New York City around their open data initiatives and now is leading the charge uh, in the same capacity in New York State. And joining Andrew is Barb Cohn, Chief Data Officer in New York State, the first uh, person to hold that role in the state of New York. Dan Morgan, uh, who recently jumped from the private sector into the public sector and became the first chief data officer for the Department of Transportation is with us. And then last but not least, uh, it's my delight to, to say hello to Jennifer Bellicent, who joins us uh, from Forrester Research. She covers open data, e-government, and other related topics uh, for that great institution, joins us all the way from the French Alps. So thank you for, for joining us here, uh, Jennifer. So these are some of the great thinkers uh, in the open data arena, and as I mentioned, I would encourage you to get to know them over the next day or two. But I'd also like to introduce some of the most innovative open data thinkers in this space, and I'm just delighted that they're now colleagues of mine at Socrata. So you already met one of them, Beth Blauer, who now runs our, our um, performance uh, line of business. Uh, Beth was previously the chief of staff for Governor Martin O'Malley in the state of Maryland, where she ran the state stat business unit. Chris Reith, who's, who's kind of behind the scenes as the uh, production director uh, for this event, uh, helping keeping everybody on task and on, on time, also previously worked for Governor O'Malley in the state of Maryland and was responsible uh, for the state stat business unit after uh, Beth departed. So Governor O, I'm not sure if you're in the audience yet, but I apologize for hiring all your best employees. I'll, I'll try to slow down the pace of grabbing them. Uh, Ian Kalin, uh, one of the uh, inaugural White House Presidential Inno Innovation Fellows. He'll be giving a talk later today on the Open Data Network. He's with us. Uh, Ian is just one of the pioneers of the open data movement. He worked previously with U.S. CTO Todd Park on open data policy for the federal government. Ari Hoffnung, one of my favorite former public servants, previously the deputy controller for New York City, now a financial transparency subject matter expert for us at Socrata. Jeff Kaplan, who for the last 10 years has been working on open data policy and strategy on behalf of the World Bank and the United Nations, helping develop those policies and strategies for countries in Latin America, in Asia, in Africa, and other parts around the world. I'm delighted that he now runs our, our multilateral uh, business unit. 
Valerie Moyer, who's a, a relatively recent addition to Socrata as a data analyst here in our Washington, D.C. office. Uh, Valerie has just an enormous passion for sustainability data and previously, before earning her master's degree from Yale, was actually the Open Data Program Director for the City of Chattanooga. So I look forward to Valerie and uh, Mayor Burke spending some time together talking about how far Chattanooga has come in a couple of years. Mark Silverberg, who literally just joined us on Monday of this week, is one of the most uh, active and prolific health data civic hackers and open data evangelists. He's really been focused on this open data arena. Even though he's fairly early in his career, he's considered to be an expert. He's won all sorts of accolades in the industry. And so we're delighted to have him focused on helping health data become more valuable and useful. And then finally, Ben, Ins ben Unsworth, uh, who, who com comes to us from the UK today. Uh, ben joined us about a year, year and a half ago. Uh, before joining us, he was the senior performance manager and research manager for Surrey County, and he's considered to be a subject matter expert in performance management in the UK. So we're delighted to have uh, those thought leaders in the space as well. So last but not least, I'd like to acknowledge my adopted hometown, uh, the Emerald City, the city of Seattle. Not only is the city of Seattle a design partner of ours, where literally every week, uh, we get to work with some incredibly passionate open data pioneers, Saber Schneider and Neil Berry, who are here with us today. Uh, but we, we literally you know, think of this, I don't think we've even shared this term with these folks, but we think of the city of Seattle as Socrata Labs. Uh, and so that's where we're doing some of our most interesting work. Uh, but not, not only is the city of Seattle a great design partner, and not only is it my adopted hometown, it's the proud headquarters of Socrata, where we've got about 40 people here today, but we've got 60 or 70 more folks working on the most important advances in open data technology back at headquarters. And I'm excited to share with you today and tomorrow some of the work that they've been doing that uh, they, weren't, they weren't able to hear, be here and share with you uh, first person. All right, so, so we have here in our midst uh, more than 100 uh, forward-thinking cities, towns, states, counties. Uh, collectively, these governments serve more than 100 million citizens around the country. But when you add into that our NGO partners like the World Bank and USAID and the Gates Foundation and the Carbon Disclosure Project, this room truly has global reach, potentially touching the lives of everyone living on this small connected planet of ours. And it's a good thing we're all gathered here to get together, all these big brains in a room talking about how we can advance open data. Like all of you, when we started this journey, we didn't know, you know where it would go. In fact, I would even say that today you know, we're still early in this, in this long journey of open data. But you know, we had a glimpse of what was to come way back in 2008 when the platform that we now know as Socrata got its first day in the sunlight. It was a very simple use case, actually you know, a lot like what you see here on the screen behind me where the White House is displaying visitor records of those folks who are, who are visiting the White House. We took something that was previously incomprehensible to all but the inner circles of national politics, campaign finance data, and we tried to make it a little bit more comprehensible. Ultimately, this work you know, upended the, the way things have always been done, and all at once, ordinary citizens were able to see through a more transparent window in the form of a clickable, sortable, searchable, filterable, shareable data set of, campaign, of presidential campaign donations. And in this process for themselves, they were able to see who is financing these candidates. It had never been done before in, Amer in American political history, and at that kind of empowerment of ordinary citizens to see for themselves, it's, it's as revolutionary today as it was six years ago. And since then, the good people who are participants in this open data community, many of you who are gathered in this room, have wrapped your arms around this fundamental concept, and you've been the creators of a new wave of accountability, of transparency, of, of citizen engagement, frankly, that's revolutionizing our 21st century concept of what government is all about. So as we talk about where government is going, I think it's important to talk about you know, where we've come from. So I don't know how long many of you who are government employees in our midst have been working for your governments, 
or if you're not a government employee, you know, maybe you remember many years ago going into your favorite government office like the Department of Motor Vehicles and waiting in long lines to, to interact with your government. Can you remember what government was like before email, before the internet existed? It wasn't pretty. You know, if you think about it, it was, is, it, it was hard to imagine now how information was shared back then. You know, couriers and typists and triple triplicate copies of uh, duplicate forms and carbon copy forms. It's not to diminish the great steps in self-governance self that our civilization has taken over these years, but it's fairly safe to sum up the first 200 years of the history of this republic and its peers around the globe as you know, what you might call government 1.0. And that lasted until you know, probably the mid-1990s, and then we started to see the beginnings of what we might now call you know, government uh, 2.0. And so Government 2.0 did some of the hard work of getting critical information online where it could be accessed by the world. It forced government leaders to think a little bit differently you know, about what message they wanted to convey to their citizens. The advent of email enabled civil servants to move information at speeds that were previously uh, not uh, something that they could imagine before. And so what was the reward for easing these barriers for transmitting data even faster? Well, it was more data, and more data begat demand for even more data. And of course, increased demand from citizens for a seat at the table and a share of the power. And so enter you know, this era today where we've got the data-driven government. And this is probably the right time to stop thinking about you know, using this, this software versioning metaphor for government, because if you think about it, the, this approach is dead. We've moved beyond this era of of repackaging that one directional information stream and moved into an era of an agile government. It's no longer enough to feed tiny bits of information in the form of press releases and public information requests or even town hall meetings uh, just before a big election. Government today is expected to be online 24 by 7. It's expected to be responsive, accessible, digestible, platform agnostic socially aware, interactive, and empowering with its citizens, not at or to its citizens. So what can we expect if we peek into the future of government? Well, we're seeing signs of that today. There's work already underway in, in the great city of Boston, Massachusetts, and Montgomery County, Maryland, where we're no longer content to ask the public to act as bystanders as topics as fundamental as how their government spends its money. Just a few months ago, a citizen would have to do any number of mind-numbing tasks if they ever hoped to better understand their government's budget. First, they would actually have to obtain a copy of that budget, a document that can span multiple volumes, and they'd have to be armed with you know, tremendous patience and an appetite for poring over a table of contents as they navigated to an area of interest. And once they found that area of interest, they'd, they'd need to look at tables and figures and then try to you know, attempt to understand what it was that they were looking at. If they wanted to know how one line item of a department stacked up against the totality of the budget, well, they would need to do, you know, even more analysis. They'd have to sharpen their pencils, do some arithmetic, and try to figure out what was going on. And if they wanted to know where their money was being spent, whereas in, like, on a map, well, they were out of luck. And it's the same story if they're hoping for an update on the progress of a budget. You know, if they wanted to know how a big capital project was performing, you know, the only recourse that they had was to wait until the next year that the budget was printed. So the future of government is in reimagining this entire relationship. Instead of asking citizens to passively read about what will happen with their investments, we can ask them to explore it with us, to navigate with their own hands, and envision the relationship of place in this process. To get there, we had to reimagine how government and citizens excuse me, interact, not as simply the disseminator of information, but as the facilitator of a broader learning and understanding about our shared data. It's about serving government up as a platform so what would happen when government operates like a platform? Well, in the context of data, it means the government data is where it needs to be, where you're making the small and big decisions that impact your daily life. 
So for example, what's the best way to get across town on public transportation? Well, instead of pouring over ledgers of transit schedules on your .gov website, now we can use great apps like CityMapper with its delightful user experience. So these are the kinds of citizen engagement experiences we at Socrata are so excited to be bringing into reality today and for decades to come. So over the next two days, we want to share with you more about our vision for how these interactions are made possible. We're going to, we're going to give you a first true look at a very exciting platform we've been developing to meet the, me meet the needs of not only data-driven governments, but data-demanding citizens as well. I think you'll agree that it's going to be a game changer in the experience of open data that we provide. But it's important to remember that none of our work would be possible without the creativity, passion, and vision of all of you in this room. This summit is all about providing a space for you and your peers to exchange ideas, to exchange best practices, to embark on this journey together and share your passion for open data and the future of government with other thought leaders in this conference here over the next day or two. So I'm excited to hear more from each of you, to share some ideas with you, to have great conversations, to meet new friends. But first, I'd like to set some stage for you. I'd like to share with you some of my own kind of personal views about where open data is going. So as the founder and CEO of Socrata, I have the pleasure of thinking about open data all day, every day, 24 by 7. This is all I think about, uh, and, I, and I love it. Uh, and so I want to share with you uh, some of my thoughts about, about where we're going uh, with open data. Okay. All right, well, we caught the tail end of that. So, um, <laughs> so, so what I, what I want to walk you through now is, uh, is this idea that we have about uh, making data far more useful. So what I'm going to try to do is, is take you not on just a, a journey, but literally a data odyssey, where we're going to go from past to present to future and talk about what impact there will be with open data as we go through this time progression. So today, or maybe you know, a few years ago, before each of you adopted open data in your cities and counties and states, data was largely at, locked and entombed at rest. It was trapped in enterprise data silos and not very useful. And so what we're going to do is really try to take that data and make it much more useful and much more connected on two different dimensions. So on one dimension, we're going to take that raw data, we're going to enrich it, enhance it, combine it, mash it up, do all sorts of interesting things around it, around the, the arenas of categorizing it and standardizing it, and ultimately, we're going to make it highly assimilated into the everyday services that you already use. And on the other dimension, we're going to take that government data, which in the past was largely the domain of a very narrow and exclusive audience of DBAs and data practitioners deep in the, in the labyrinth of government. And we're going to open that up through new interfaces and new contexts to literally make it mass consumer data. So everybody will be accessing government data in the applications and the services that they use on a regular basis. And so to get there, uh, there's a journey. Uh, and that journey started with, with uh, portals and dashboards a couple of years ago. And so some of the things that, that were common when we introduced portals and dashboards were you know, putting together all these data sets in some sort of a catalog that was searchable and explorable. We wrapped each data set with a basic application programming interface so that programmers could use that data programmatically. Uh, we made it sortable and searchable and filterable so you could interactively explore data. Collectively, we as an open data community uh, made that experience one that could be visualized. You could turn data into a chart or a graph or a map. And ultimately, we allowed people to create citizen-facing dashboards to get some kind of a glimpse about how governments were performing. And then kind of the next phase of making data far more useful was turning data, turning your open data initiative into data as a platform. And so in this phase, we see all sorts of opportunities like creating custom application programming endpoints for the data that you have, not just a generic API endpoint. We saw, we saw the creation of all kinds of data connectors to get data in and to get data out. Uh, we started to automate the data ingestion process to streamline the flow of data from your underlying system of record, your enterprise database, into what we think of as the system of engagement. We started to see the creation of custom user interfaces and reports around open data. 
Uh, we started to see the opportunities when you combined multiple data sets together from multiple data sources. You could start to glean all sorts of new insights. And finally, we've been able to enrich and enhance and make that data even more valuable. And so kind of where we're right at the forefront of today is a connected ecosystem around open data where you're starting to literally see things where government data is being syndicated to the consumer web. And you'll hear a little bit more about how we're doing that uh, later today and tomorrow with our partners like Zillow and Google. Recently, Socrata started introducing first-party apps to provide more tailored experiences around specific data sets. So earlier this week, we introduced Service Connect, which is for 311 data. A few months ago, we introduced a financial transparency suite for government spending data. We're now starting to see third-party app ma marketplaces form where companies like SiteComply are creating uh, all sorts of interesting applications with government data. We're seeing intelligent data federation. What I mean by that is federating data across jurisdictions, not just uh, you know, state to state, city to city, county to county, but regionally, creating regional data hubs that are far more intelligent uh, than before. We're starting to see some standardization and normalization of data as well. Uh, we're starting to see some data science powered UX that I'm going to talk about a little bit. Saf will tell you a little bit about, and Deep will tell you about more over the course of the next couple of days as well. And then finally, uh, we're seeing data standards emerge around open data so that data can be shared and compared and benchmarked across uh, different uh, organizations. And so, you know, ultimately what this means is that data is going to be far more valuable. Uh, and so what we're seeing now is, is the formation of a network around data. So, you know, some of the things that you'll see are literally new industries emerge around government data, companies being created, jobs being created. You're going to see government data become a genuine asset in your community. Uh, you're going to see people commercialize these data assets, combine different government data sources, enrich it, enhance it, and create all sorts of new economic opportunities around your data. Uh, you're going to see corpus-wide or enterprise-wide data analytics. So, you know, what, what I mean by that is you're going to see government organizations themselves tap into their own open data to be able to have an enterprise-wide view of what's going on within their institution. You're going to see unprecedented intergovernmental cooperation around data. I think you're going to see the stature of civic developers being elevated from hobbyists to professionals. You're going to see the stature of you all in this room, open data practitioners, elevate as well. And ultimately what this is going to do is it's going to improve our everyday lives, it's going to improve the lives of citizens, it's going to improve the lives of you all as government employees as well. And ultimately what we're going to get to is where data is, government data is just incredibly valuable, not only for external citizens and developers and entrepreneurs and journalists, but also it's incredibly valuable to you all as government employees. So that's, that's the view that I have of where we're going uh, with open data. So what's Socrata's role in this journey? You know, if you had heard all of that theme song, you would think that our role would be to, to be Captain Kirk in this journey. But, but no, that's actually not our role at all. Our role is actually rather to be a really important facilitator, stimulating discussions, stimulating experiments, seeing how we can stimulate collaboration across all sorts of government jurisdictions. Yeah, we want to get cities to work with other cities, and we want to get counties to work with counties, and we want to see states working with states, but we also want to see cities and counties and states and towns work regionally on tough municipal and regional problems in their area. You know, frankly, citizens and developers and entrepreneurs, they don't care what jurisdiction your data comes from. They just want to get your data where it's most useful to them. So we want to act as convener. We want to bring the publishers and consumers of government data to this collective communal open data table. We want to help the entrepreneurs and developers of these commercial services to have a stronger relationship with the government organizations that are publishing this data. So we're working hard on developing connected ecosystems. And so, you know, what does that mean? Well, we want to connect health organizations together, the publishers and the consumers around health data so that industries, companies, and jobs can be created. We want to see health care improve. We want to see people live healthier lives, and, and we think we can play a very small role in that, in that process and stimulate some of these outcomes by helping connect a health data ecosystem. 
We want to connect transportation-focused organizations, the government data publishers and consumers around transportation data so that the experience of riding public transit will be safer, it will be better, it will be more enjoyable and more satisfying. And we think we can play a small role there by helping create a, a connected ecosystem around transportation data. We want to connect the organizations that are focused on climate and the environment and sustainability to create companies and jobs and solve some of the really hard problems that our planet faces. And we think we can play a small role in that outcome by being a facilitator in creating a connected ecosystem around this kind of data. So this is way more than government data for transparency's sake or for accountability's sake. It's about data that matters where it matters most to the people who need it. It's about a better planet. It's about better jobs. It's about a higher quality of life and a standard of living. It's the va as the value of open data increases exponentially, when we think the value of open data will increase exponentially as we create these connected ecosystems around your data. So my Socrata colleagues and I are working hard to not only write software that makes data more useful, but we're proactively trying to foster a sense of community around open data. It's one of the reasons, frankly, why we're ho hosting this event here today and tomorrow. And you know, why are we doing that? It's because communities care. You know, the reality is, and I say this as a software engineer, software itself has no soul. But communities do. Communities act. Communities do things. Communities solve real problems. Communities take something abstract and inert like raw government data and they turn it into something concrete and useful with positive outcomes and impact. So what kind of communities are we trying to nurture? Well, frankly, there's lots of them. Communities of citizens interested in how government operates. Communities of developers interested in incorporating government data into the apps they're creating and building new services that deliver services previously delivered by governments themselves. Communities of, of engaged journalists, researchers, and analysts. Communities of government data stewards and data wranglers. Communities of entrepreneurs interested in building industries and companies and jobs around government data. And frankly, communities of open data practitioners like you all in this room. We want to bring you all together today physically uh, but enduringly, virtually, and we want to help you parlay your passion for open data from perhaps a project that you're working on today sporadically into a full-time career. We want to help you land that first chief data officer role in that really exciting, innovative government agency that is leading by example. So we're trying to humanize open data, and we're trying to do that intentionally by investing in developing these communities. So one of the things that I, that I really want to spend some time talking about is something that I'm personally really passionate about, and it's called the Open Data Network. Uh, we launched this a couple of months ago, and you know we, I really haven't spent a lot of time publicly speaking about it yet, and that's been intentional. I actually wanted to really unveil the Open Data Network at this event, at the Customer Summit with you all, our customers and our partners, and there's some breakout sessions and some keynotes uh, later in the conference that, that dive deeply into the Open Data Network. But I want to spend a few minutes talking about the Open Data Network here in my opening remarks. Um, so I think at a macro level, the way that you guys can think about Socrata is we do two things. Uh, one is we build cloud-based open data software, but two is we operate the Open Data Network. It's that important at a top level. These are the two things that we as an organization do. So. Though we introduced this you know, a few months ago, as I said, I really haven't talked about it yet. So I want to tell you a little bit more about you know, what this open data network is all about. And I, and I guess where I'll start is I'll tell you it's an enormous undertaking. This is not trivial. By the time that we are done with this, you will see just what an immense, what a, what an immense and expansive uh, uh, project this is for us. So it's a lot of things, uh, and I think it'll, it'll make more sense uh, when Ian Kalin gives a presentation uh, later uh, today, I think. But I'll tell you a little bit about it. So, so first of all, it's a distribution channel for government data. It's a destination website where anyone can go and compare and share and mash up government data across multiple jurisdictions, not just from one, uh, data or one government organization. It's an apps market marketplace. It's a community. It's a place where commercial and consumer service providers can go to get streamlined access 
uh, to government data across these multiple jurisdictions. And it relies on a pretty big investment that we're making at Socrata in data science to, ca to categorize and standardize data. Uh, this data science relies both on machine learning and crowdsourced human categorization of data. Uh, if you're not familiar with some of the things that we've been doing over the last 15 months or so, uh, we've spun up a, uh, a data science team in Seattle. Uh, literally, this has uh, a number of, of experts in machine learning and natural language processing, text mining, uh, people with uh, uh, PhDs in computer science and related uh, disciplines that are doing you know, really important work in this arena of open data to, tr to try to make sense of this data. And so you know, what you're going to see is this, uh, when we're able to categorize and standardize and normalize data across government jurisdictions, that data is going to have significantly more value and impact on people's everyday lives. And so that's why we're, we're willing to make this investment in it. And so if you're interested in the data science behind it, and I would encourage you to take an active interest in it, uh, there's, there's two more things that you could do as a follow-up. So, so first of all, uh, later in the morning, I think at 11 o'clock here in this room, SAF's going to unroll the Socrata product roadmap, showing you some of the things that we're introducing uh, into the market literally uh, today and this week as we speak and over the next few months. And uh, most significantly is uh, what we call a data science powered user experience where this standardization and this categorization and this understanding of data can result in a better default user experience for every data set. And then the second thing you can do to learn a little bit more about the investments that we're making in uh, data science is go and attend uh, Deep Dillon's talk uh, tomorrow. I think it's in the same room at 2 o'clock. Uh, Deep is our chief technology officer, uh, himself one of the subject matter experts in uh, NLP and machine learning. Uh, and he's been just doing a wonderful job leading this team in categorizing uh, all of this data. So, so why are we making these investments? Why are we building out the open data network? And Frankly, it's because we believe the open data network is going to transform open data from something that governments do today in relatively isolated ways. You know, data.chicago.gov and data.sanfrancisco.gov are you know, not all that related to each other, frankly, uh, to something that actually unites governments around their data. We think the benefits of the open data network are going to be significant. It's going to power comparative analytics, which are going to allow you to compare, share, and benchmark the performance of one government to another. It's going to allow the solutions of the thorniest problems to spread from one government to another very quickly. You know, when you see something like how Chicago solves a problem with rodent invest infestation, you're going to be able to see the solution to that problem spread to every other city through the open data network uh, very quickly. Uh, we're going to see civic developers elevate their, their stature from hobbyists to professionals. They're going to literally quit their day jobs where you know, they're working somewhere in insurance companies and software companies, you know, working on their open data passions at night. You're going to see them quit their jobs and create new companies and hire more people and, and create all sorts of ecosystems around government data. We think uh, it's going to pull together open data practitioners into a community where they can share best practices and learn from each other and even advance their own careers. And ultimately, we think it's going to get data to where people are making their daily decisions big and small. So the open data is going to help with the, with the dissemination of data to where it's most useful into the places where they're already making their decisions in their daily lives. You know, if you think about it, you know, if, if data just gets to where it needs to go, it might help in, you know, very minor ways like shaving five minutes off your commute today. But you think about the big decisions in your life. You think about, you know, maybe buying a new house. Well, you know, what's the logic chain or what's the thought process that somebody goes through buying a new home? Well, certainly they care about how much does, that, does the house cost because I have to live within a certain budget. How good are the schools? How safe is the neighborhood? How close am I to public transportation? Well, the source of all that data is government. And if we can just make that raw data flow to where it needs to go, where, where great companies like Zillow can take that and build a neighborhood finder and a home finder, it gets the data to where you're making these most important decisions in your everyday life. And so we think that's the power of the open data network, and that's the vision that we're excited to work on over the next year or two as we roll this out. So, so as I mentioned, uh, Ian Kalin uh, has, a, has a presentation where he'll go a lot deeper into the open data network and uh, he'll, he'll invite to uh, uh, 
share in the conversation with some of the companies that are, that are already participating in the Open Data Network. So you'll get a much deeper understanding of it. I would encourage you to go to that talk. I think it's at about 3.30 uh, this afternoon in this same room. So open data is a big movement. Uh, it's a huge domain, and you know it takes a village. Uh, there's more than 130 super passionate employees at Socrata. We're all big fans of open data. We're working hard, but frankly, 130 people is not enough. We need 130,000 people uh, to really make open data have the impact that we want it to have. And so, you know, we're thrilled that there are a number of great organizations working on the same domain that we are. So, uh, the Open Data Institute, the Data Transparency Coalition, the National League of Cities, Zillow, SiteComply, Google, Deloitte, SunGuard, Seidel, those are just some of the organizations that are working on open data, and it's great to see uh, that they're as passionate about these things as we are. So I'm super glad that we're all together in this space. Uh, it's, it's thrilling for me as the founder and CEO of Socrata to be able to host you all at our first customer summit. Uh, you know, I'm excited to bring together the experiences of big governments and small of big companies and small nonprofits, uh, NGOs. There's researchers among us, journalists among us, economists among us. There are entrepreneurs. There are great public servants among us. So I encourage you all to really get to know each other over the next day or two. Share best practices. Share your ideas for the future powered by open data. You know, I encourage you all to find me, uh, chat with me. I'm eager to get to know those of you who I don't know. I'm eager to reconnect with those of you who I already do know. And I'm eager to continue on this, uh, this great open data odyssey that we're on together. So thank you. <laughs>